Hi everyone, this is just going to be a short video about the final valuation methodology that I'm planning to discuss, which is sometimes called the venture capital method. So this, uh, this method of valuation um, sits sort of on top of some of the early valuation methods that we discussed, in particular relative valuation, where we consider some kind of operating metric uh, and then estimate the value of an asset as a multiple of, uh, of that operating metric. Um, precedent transaction, which is a particular case of relative value valuation where we use a financial metric um, and, the, uh, and the firms that we use in order to uh, figure out the multiplier to apply to that metric are typically based on earlier transactions that have occurred uh, in the recent past, typically in the same industry. Um, DCF, or discounted cash flow valuation, which is going to apply estimates for future cash flows, in theory extending uh, all the way for the potentially infinite future life of the asset, um, discounted by some uh, rate, typically the weighted average cost of capital, designed to capture both the fact that investors don't like waiting to get paid uh, those cash flows, but also that they bear some risk. Uh, and so we're going to increase the cost of capital relative to a pure patients-related discount rate in order to, uh, to take into account the fact that there's risk, uh, both in terms of the forecasts not necessarily being accurate um, and, the, uh, and the firm not necessarily actually delivering uh, those expected cash flows. Um, the venture capital method, the final valuation method that we're going to discuss, is really a combination um, of those three. And in particular, the venture capital method is going to apply DCF or discounted cash flow, um, making uh, some simplifying assumptions in particular, that the asset in question does not actually deliver any cash flows to the investors in the short term. So we're going to zero out all of the short term cash flows. Uh, we're going to consider only, in fact, a single future cash flow, which we would often call a terminal value. And the terminal value that we assign to the asset when we value it is typically going to be based on a transaction-based relative valuation. Um, and so in our case, we're going to apply a price to earnings uh, multiple to value the exit um, when the investor, in this case typically a venture capital firm, plans on exiting their position. Uh, we're sort of the stereotypical examples of how they might exit, although not in, in reality. The only ways that they could exit are going to be either through an IPO or initial public offering uh, or through a strategic acquisition by another firm um, that wants to, to own um, to own the portfolio company uh, in order to operate it. So, um, so a reminder up at the top about how DCF worked, um, which was that we were going to get the value of some operating asset by calculating free cash flows, looking ahead over some time horizon, um, and then include the value of the asset at some point in the future that we typically called the terminal value, all of which we're going to get discounted using a discount rate where, again, typically we use a weighted average cost of capital. So the VC method is going to make a simplifying assumption, which is that all of those short-term uh, cash flows are equal to zero on the assumption um, that firms, and typically this method might get used for, uh, for high-tech firms or firms which are otherwise investing uh, all of their cash flows in, say, customer acquisition or otherwise uh, in pursuing future growth. So by zeroing out those future cash flows, we get that the value today of the asset is just going to be um, the terminal value, the value at some uh, proposed exit date and periods in the future, discounted back uh, by uh, the weighted average cost of capital or investors expected rate of return um, over that N period horizon. So that exit value in the numerator is typically going to be based on a relative valuation often relying on uh, precedent transactions. And so we're going to use a PDE multiplier um, in order to come up with that terminal value methodology. And then it's going to be discounted back um, N years or N periods at the firm's WAC. Um, typically, we're going to combine this with some assessment of the firm's capital structure. Uh, but um, in the case of, of our application of the VC method, we're going to think about there being an existing capital structure uh, where there are um, some existing all equity investors who financed the firms. And so the financing that the, um, that the particular investor uh, is putting into the firm assumes that that terminal value um, that, that we've come up with is, uh, is reliant on raising a particular amount of capital um, that the investor is going to put in today as an equity injection. 
And therefore, the value of the firm uh, that we come up with this way is what we're going to call a post-money valuation. It's going to be an equity value of the firm, assuming that uh, the investor doing this valuation has put in capital. Um, and so this valuation is going to be based on an assumption that a particular amount of capital is going to get put into the firm. And we're going to um, finish up our analysis by comparing the amount of capital uh, that the investor is going to put into the firm uh, with the um, with that uh, pre-money, sorry, post-money valuation uh, and subtract out the capital uh, injection from the post-money valuation to come up with a so-called pre-money valuation, uh, which is the value of the equity that the current owners of the firm already have, assuming that the firm is able to raise uh, the needed equity injection to achieve that post-money valuation today. And by looking at the relative size of today's capital injection in that pre-money valuation, we can figure out what share uh, of the equity in the firm the investor should expect. So that's kind of the idea. Um, that is confusing. Uh, I, I Hopefully it's not as confusing as before I explained it, but I bet it's still confusing. Um, so I think the easiest way to try to clarify this is by working quickly through an example. So um, this is going to be an example application of the VC method. Um, and this is going to be a valuation um, of a firm which we expect to be able to earn two and a half million dollars five years from now anticipating the possibility of an exit where again that might be an IPO or it might be an acquisition five years from now and the multiplier that we use here might not be on priced earnings so you could imagine all of the other kind of relative valuations that we discussed earlier which might be on a pure operating metric uh, and so we might be valuing the firm and exit using something like a value per user uh, or a value per um, hour of engagement or a value per dollar of revenue, a value per dollar of ad sales, um, any one of a number of multiplier-based valuations. I'm going to be using a, a, a private uh, price-to-earnings ratio of 15, um, where I'm just assuming that, but presumably that might be based on looking at some precedent transactions. So uh, at what kinds of price-to-earnings ratios have firms in this industry typically been able to uh, IPO or be acquired uh, strategically? Um, now, I perceive that there's this high risk uh, to that forecast, so I'm not actually at all highly confident that the firm is going to be able to earn two and a half million dollars five years from now, uh, nor that it necessarily could actually exit five years from now, nor am I confident that if it exits, it's going to receive a valuation uh, associated with a PDE ratio of 15. And so given the, that high degree of uncertainty, uh, I'm actually going to require a 50% uh, annual return on my investment. And so that's the discount rate that I'm going to use. Um, now, in order to achieve that, the valuation associated with a two and a half million dollar earnings uh, and a 15 PDE ratio five years from now, the firm, I assume, is insufficiently capitalized now. If they had enough money uh, to achieve that valuation, they wouldn't need perhaps to raise any money from me. Uh, but I think uh, that they need three and a half million dollars uh, of funds today in order to make the kind of investment perhaps in talent, uh, customer acquisition, um, or other forms of investment. And so uh, so my assumption is that in order to achieve that valuation, they need to raise three and a half million dollars today. So we're going to start by trying to figure out what the post money valuation is. Uh, that is to say, what would the value of the business have to be uh, 15, um, if it received three and a half million dollars from me today um, and was then successfully able uh, to achieve an expected um, valuation associated with uh, a PDE ratio of 15 on our $2.5 million earnings five years from now. So that's going to be the first step is calculating that post-money valuation. And in order to do that, we're going to start by trying to calculate the value of the firm 15, uh, five years from now, which we will then discount back to get um, a valuation today. So given the multiplier, the value of the firm 15... Uh, wrote 15, I meant to write five years from now, should be equal to the two and a half million dollars of earnings that we forecast times the PDE ratio of 15 million, okay, which is going to represent a 37 and a half million dollar value at the time of exit five years in the future. Again, there's a high degree of uncertainty around that. And so in order to figure out the post-money valuation of the firm today, I'm going to discount that and I'm going to discount it very aggressively given the high degree of uncertainty, um, which is to say I'm going to get a value for the firm today at time zero. But again, that's a post-money valuation. So a valuation assuming that they've already received three and a half million dollars of equity um, injection 
by discounting that $37.5 million um, future valuation by one plus my discount rate of 50% or 1.5 raised to the fifth power. So now I got to get my calculator out. Um, I'm going to divide 37.5 by 1.5 raised to the fifth power, which of course I could also do using the built-in time value of money features in my calculator where the numerator of 37.5 million is the future value. Uh, the discount rate of 50 uh, or 50% 50 is I the interest rate and N is the number of periods. Uh, but when I do this, I get a 4.94 million dollars or approximate 4.94 um, million dollar post money valuation today. Okay, so that's the first part of the exercise is just um, calculating the value of the asset N periods from now and discounting it back at my WAC in order to get um, that, uh, that post money valuation, which in this case is about $4.9 million. Now, that's the value of the business only after it receives a $3.5 million equity injection from me today, which means it's pre-money valuation, the value of the current equity holder's stakes, assuming that they get my $3.5 million dollars, um, should be the $4.9 million minus the $3.5 million that I'm going to inject, which means that the current equity holder stake in the company is worth the difference of about $1.4 million. So my assumption is that the current equity in the firm is worth $1.4 million. Uh, my equity today is worth $3.5 million, exactly what I'm going to pay for it. Uh, and therefore, the equity share that I'm going to be getting in the business, given my $4.9 million valuation, is going to be 3.5 divided by 4.9, or a little bit south of 70% for me. Um, and 1.4 divided by 4.9, or about 30% uh, for the current equity investors. So that's really what there is uh, to it. Um, here's a spreadsheet that lays that math out. Um, and these slides obviously are available for you to download uh, and work through. So um, this just works through in a little bit more detail. Uh, exactly the valuation that we just did, starting with calculating the future value of the firm, uh, moving to um, figuring out uh, what my equity stake is um, based on splitting that post-money valuation up into my investment and the pre-money valuation. And then finally, in the spreadsheet, we go very slightly further, um, which is uh, on an assumption that, that we know not only... Um, uh, what the value of the current equity holders stake is, but also how many shares uh, the incorporation documents have divided that ownership stake up into, uh, in this case, a million dollars. The fact that the current equity holders have a million shares um, that we've just valued uh, pre-money at about $1.44 million total means that we think their share price uh, is about a dollar and 44 cents a piece. Um, and we can also calculate the number of new shares that the firm is going to need to issue uh, in order to satisfy um, my three and a half million dollar investment. That is to say the number of shares uh, that I am going to receive. So um, if you want to go through that in more detail, it's all laid out on the slide. Um, that, uh, that spreadsheet actually comes from um, vcmethod.com, uh, which is a, a nice website. Um, not built by me, uh, but that includes this spreadsheet actually as an embedded Google Doc, and so you can play with the assumptions, um, and there's also some more information about the method there. So um, that is what I have to say about the VC method. Um, some final words on valuation, tying this to, uh, to some of what we had to say about the other valuation methodologies. No single technique can provide um, a single or final answer regarding a firm's true value. Uh, this is true for a couple of reasons. One is there's a high degree of uncertainty about exactly what inputs we should be putting to these models. So when we use relative valuation, uh, there's a variety of different benchmarks that we could use, whether those are operating benchmarks or financial benchmarks. Um, there may be uncertainty around what 
uh, the accurate numbers are for those benchmarks. Um, so the square footage of a property may be ambiguous because we don't know whether or not we should be including uh, unfinished space like the garage. Um, the financial reports from a company, especially uh, non-public companies, which may not be subject to uh, to the same degree of oversight for their accounting reports. Um, we may not actually know exactly what the accuracy of those numbers are. And even more than that, we really don't necessarily know what the right value of the multiplier is to be applying are. When we apply uh, precedent transaction analysis, that shows up in terms of uncertainty about what transactions we should be using uh, and which a variety of different financial multipliers we should be applying there. Um, and all of those things flow through uh, to VC, this VC method as well. Of course, with DCF, um, there's a great deal of uncertainty about both our cash flow forecasts uh, and the calculation of the appropriate uh, discount rate, whether that's the weighted average cost of capital or otherwise. Um, in fact, though, all of the points that I just made uh, about the, our inability to rely on a single objectively correct technique for valuing an asset, uh, in fact, understate the case. The real issue is that the value of any financial asset is based only on what a buyer is willing to pay and what a seller is willing to sell at. And so all of the valuation methodologies that we've applied are in a sense based on an assumption that buyers and sellers are willing to agree on assumptions um, that underlie these valuation methodologies and are prepared to actually affect a transaction at those prices, which may or may not be the case. So all of these approaches are relying on assumptions and forecasts. Um, and typically what we're going to do if we want to try to come up with an assessment of firm's value is we're going to rely on some combination of the approaches. Uh, and we're also going to rely on sensitivity analysis where we try to plug in a variety of different values for those assumptions. Um, and even having done that and arrived on a range of valuations, that does not mean that we can necessarily expect to be able to buy, nor should we necessarily be prepared to sell a given asset uh, at a price that lies within those ranges, because ultimately the value of an asset is going to be the result of a negotiation. Um, that negotiation may be about which assumptions and which forecasts the buyer and the seller can agree on, but it may also just be about how, uh, how they value the asset, not just numerically, um, but also based on uh, whether they actually accept, the buyer and the seller actually accept um, the assumptions required for these valuation methodologies to be appropriate. So that is, uh, that is what I have to say about that. I am looking forward um, to seeing all of you soon. And as always, please feel free to, uh, to send any questions um, or let me know if there's anything you'd like to talk about on this or otherwise uh, in our course material. Thanks.